we begin with what I've chosen to call anti-avant-garde. This designation refers to the stylistic path chosen by these two composers, among others, that led them away from mid 20th century serialism and instead to tonal music. Now to be sure, the traditional harmonic landscape is greatly expanded with this music, as you will hear. To put it another way, dissonance just isn't what it used to be. It often doesn't have the same jarring effect on the modern ear, both for composers and audiences. These specific American composers and their colleagues were not the first uh, to go against the, to the atonal grain. Samuel Barber and Giancarlo Minotti were two such earlier composers who were particularly interested in works for the voice, and they are often called neo-romantic composers. This term is significant to our discussion this evening, so again, another definition, this time from Grove Music Online. The term is used to refer to the return to emotional expression associated with 19th century romanticism. Neo-romantic refers to the composer's return to tonality as a structural and expressive element. So Barber and Minotti and many of their colleagues were returning to tonality for the structure, think the patterns of tension and release and cadences and the expressive qualities it provides. Their students, the following generation of song composers, tended to use tonality for these same properties. And among these tonal song composer students, we come to Lee Hoiby and Richard Hundley. Speaking specifically of Hoiby's 1964 opera, Natalia Petrovna, New York Times reviewer Harold Schoenberg wrote, quote, his style is simple, romantic, traditional, and cosmopolitan. Much of his score could have been composed 100 years ago. Neo-romantic, right? But elsewhere, Hoiby specifically calls himself merely a romantic, suggesting that he isn't returning from any modernist tendencies. His language is and always was tonal. Here is a particularly telling quote from the composer himself. If music doesn't have melody and harmony and rhythm, as I understand it, I'm not interested. A lot of that stuff sounds like wallpaper to me. <clears throat> <clears throat> most of tonight's composers are known primarily for their art songs. In addition, I suggest that most of tonight's composers are also at least in part, at least in part, neo-romantic, or if they prefer, romantic. Uh, whether they actually describe themselves as such or not. Perhaps Hoiby's off-the-cuff remark can work as a gauge of neo-romantic tendencies. Music must have melody, harmony, and rhythm, and not sound like wallpaper, as we look and listen a bit more closely to those who follow him on tonight's program. One other general assertion we, before, we begin taking look, uh, before we begin looking at specific songs. I believe that composers tend towards tonality, particularly when writing songs whether this has to do with the inclusion of text into the creative process or the specific images or stories that, the wor that these words conjure, or the composer's desire to marry that text with a harmonic language, uh, language that maximizes the emotional impact of the combination of the two, or quality is inherent in the human voice. I don't know. If there were any kind of financial fortune to be found by writing art songs, I could maybe understand composers wanting to make their music particularly accessible, employing a tonal language. Perhaps Hoiby has more wisdom to dispense on this topic. Singers, he says, you can't fool them. When they hear a song, they can tell right away if it's going to make them sound good. <laughs> and mine, and mine do. <laughs> Musically, that, that's Hoiby talking, just for the record, not me. <laughs> Um, musically, Hoiby employs mostly traditional functional harmony, but includes enharmonic pitches, stacked tertian or jazz sonorities. Uh, most of his chosen dissonances seem to result from a stepwise voice leading. He employs a steady rhythmic pulse, but not a consistent meter, and time signatures change constantly to suit the inflection of the language and the dramatic timing of the words. Like most romantic works for the voice, the vocal line is pleasing to sing, has a natural setting of stressed syllables and downbeats, and appropriate places to breathe based on the text. Finally, for the pianist, the accompaniment is, idi is idiomatic and complementary to the instrument. The piano part is supported to the singer, but leaves room for the voice to be heard. One second here. <clears throat> Like the vast majority of composers featured this evening, Richard Hundley started his musical training as a pianist. From his birthplace of Cincinnati, Ohio, Hundley moved to New York City and joined the Metropolitan Opera Chorus. 
In his years at the Met, Hundley shared some of his songs with that company's stars, who in turn programmed them on the recitals. <clears throat> in my research, I stumbled upon another opera news article by American song advocate and performer Paul Sperry. In it, he chose to highlight Hundley as one of the, uh, the United States' most gifted composers who is not well known outside the world of song. Sperry does not just offer high praise for Hundley, he pinpoints his musical style beautifully in the following excerpted paragraph. Richard Hundley says his objective is to crystallize emotion. He succeeds amazingly well. He has mastered the art of agonizing over details until he produces something that sounds simple, even inevitable. I think he has taken this apparent simplicity of his teacher and friend, the well-known American composer and music critic, Virgil Thompson, and invested it with more urgent emotion. His melodies stay in the mind. In his harmonies and open spacings, he sounds American, in the sense that Copeland created a recognizably American sound. And he has the American gift for exuberance and humor. Before we hear the two works back to back, here are some particular features of Hundley's song. Like Hoibe's song, the voice part is pleasing to sing, the time signatures and note values are consistently chosen to reflect the exact inflection of the text. Unlike Hoiby, Hundley's expressive markings are numerous, not leaving room for much uh, interpretation. The tonality changes rapidly to reflect the different scenarios of each of the characters in the story. Hundley is very fond of using special motives to paint various elements in the text, and he uses the piano accompaniment to do it. Um, so the piano prelude states one theme, um, uh, and in, in it, the scene opens, and we see the seashore before us. You also hear music that suggests these girls are playing at the beach. Let's sit back and enjoy these neo-romantic selections. Lee Hoibe's A Clear Midnight, third song from the set I Was There, Five Poems of Walt Whitman, and Richard Hundley's Seashore Girls, text by E.E. E. Cummings, the second song from his set Octaves and Sweet Sounds. <laughs> <laughs> 